Keep your place there in Acts chapter 6. We're coming right back to it. And I had you put a bookmark in Hebrews chapter 6. I'm just going to read the first two verses for you there of Hebrews 6. The Bible reads, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Now, um, and at the end of Hebrews chapter 5, it basically says that, you know, there's people that, are, that want to be teachers of God's law, but they need that someone teach them again, uh, which be the principles of the oracles of God, and that they are in need of milk and not strong meat. And Hebrews, if you're familiar with the Bible at all, if you've read the book of Hebrews, it could cover what a lot of people consider to be more difficult concepts. It's a, maybe a harder book to read or to understand, and it goes into a lot of doctrine that's not necessarily the milk of the word. And what I plan on doing here in the next few weeks, not necessarily a series, but it's very important to go back to fundamentals, to go back to teaching basic truths, because we want to prevent serious heresies and doctrinal errors from creeping into the church. And it's good to hear these things kind of regularly, right? It's, it's easy as a pastor to just assume, oh, everybody believes this, right? And just think, oh, this is such a, a fundamental, this is such a, a basic thing, a basic principle. If you're a Baptist, you believe this stuff. I don't want to have that mentality. It's dangerous to have that mentality. We need to be going over these things. Now, we're going to get into meat of the word, but we also need some of the milk. And when I was reading this passage, I was reading Hebrews 6, chapter 1. We're going to be coming up. I'm going to be doing sermons on baptisms, the resurrection of the dead, eternal judgment. But what I want to deal with this morning is the laying on of hands. This is something that's actually considered here to be a very, very milk type of doctrine. Not very strong, right? He's really saying, not, you know, we're going to leave the principles, you know, the first thing, the principles of the doctrine of Christ. Obviously, the doctrine of Christ is the most important, how he came and, and bled and died for our sins and rose again from that. And, and, you know, and these things are all critical to our faith. But in this chapter, he wants to move on to something else. He says, let us go on to perfection. And he lists all these various things, not laying in the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, baptisms, and he says, laying out of hands. Now, this is something that I think probably has a little bit of confusion today because I don't think this is preached on very often. I know I haven't heard very many sermons about this subject particularly. Now in the Bible, but it's still a basic concept and a basic doctrine, so we're going to go over this this morning. There's basically three or four main reasons that you'll see a phrase similar to laying on of hands that we see here in Hebrews chapter 6. Now, the laying on of hands that's talking about here is very specific, but if you just did word searches and kind of tried to find all the various places you could find something similar to people having hands laid on them, you'll find approximately four, excuse me, scenarios. One is where people are physically laying hands on somebody to like arrest them or to cast them out of something. So you'll find people having hands laid on them. That's not what this is talking about. This isn't talking about the physical removal. If you remember uh, in Nehemiah, Nehemiah was warning the people who were coming to sell on the Sabbath where he closed the gates. He's like, look, you come back again, I'm going to lay hands on you. That's not the same laying on of hands that Hebrews 6 is talking about. You'll also find uh, in the Old Testament when they were performing sacrifices, oftentimes they would lay their hands on the heads of the bulls and the goats and the things that they were sacrificing. They would lay their hands on the scapegoat for the scapegoat to carry the sins of the people you know, out of the camp and out, and out in the wilderness. Um, that's not what this is talking about either, although you may be able to draw some, some parallels and symbolism from that, but um, we're not going to do that this morning. Uh, another main uh, point as far as laying on of hands is going to be with healing the sick. So when, uh, when the disciples, when the apostles were going out and healing people as Jesus Christ had done, when he endued them with, with power from the Holy Ghost, they would lay their hands on people and they would receive healing from the Holy Ghost. And uh, that was also um, one of the instances where you find people laying hands on people. But I also don't believe that that's what this is talking about either. The, the fourth point and what we're going to deal with this morning is 
the laying on of hands when it comes to appointing leaders and just giving the power of the Holy Ghost. And this is one of those fundamental doctrines that goes right along with the baptism, the resurrection of dead, eternal judgment. And you're in Acts chapter 6. We see a story here where there is where, where people have uh, hands laid on them. Look at verse number 1. We'll reread Acts 6, 1. The Bible says, And in those days, when the number of the, dis of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Now what we see here, this is, this is early. This is the early in the book of Acts, early in church history, shortly after Jesus Christ is resurrected from the dead. You, you start seeing, this is after the day of Pentecost when thousands of people were saved. The church is just growing and multiplying by leaps and bounds. You have people, you have the apostles going out, winning souls to Christ, and the church is just growing tremendously. And what we see here is that the church had grown so much. That's why it says in verse number one, the Grecians, the Greeks that were getting saved, were starting to complain. They're members of the church. They had gotten saved. They started a church. And they're saying that, look, our widows are being neglected in the daily ministration. Now, the Bible teaches us, especially in 1 Timothy chapter 5, you'll see, we're not going to turn there and read it, but the church is supposed to care for widows that are widows indeed. Widows that, that are left, you know, they're not able to, to support themselves. They have no family. They have nobody to take care of them. They're completely alone. Well, that's the church's responsibility to take care of those people. Now, our church... We don't have any widows like that. And if we did have one or two, we wouldn't need to just hire someone on to take care of one person, right, or two people. This gives you an idea of how large this church has grown. There, are, there is such a need here of day-to-day -day tasks that the church is responsible for doing, of helping people out, of helping these widows out, that the apostles said, no, we need more help. It says the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. The apostles are saying, look, the work that we have to do is more important than, not that, not that it's not important to take care of widows. He's saying, but the work that we're doing is different. We can't be distracted from the work of serving God in this way to go and help people out, but we need, it still needs to be done. They recognize this is important. It's an important job. People need to be taken care of. The widows is the church's responsibility, so we need more people to help. And they hired, basically, or employed seven people, seven more people to care for all the, the needs and the tasks. Now, if this alone doesn't show you some of the stupidity that's being put out there, there's, there's, a, there's, a church, there's a movement out there. It's called the House Church Movement. And, you know, some people might call it by different names. But basically what they do, and I'm not going to go too far in depth on this, but they try to tell you that, oh, if you meet in a building, you're not a scriptural church. If you're not meeting in, because they look at many places in the Bible where it says, you know, in the church at their house, which absolutely that's biblical this church started in my house there's nothing wrong with that so i don't want you to be confused when i when i say the house church movement is different than just churches that meet in houses okay a church can meet a church can meet in any building a church doesn't even have to be in a building a church can meet outside it doesn't matter the church is the people the church is the congregation that's what the church is 
But there's nothing wrong with whatever place you choose to meet in. It doesn't matter if you're meeting in a strip mall like we are, or if you're meeting in a house, or if you're meeting in an auditorium, doesn't matter. But they like to make a big issue out of that. And what they'll do is they'll say, see, look, the churches in the book of Acts, they had multiple elders and, you know, basically multiple bishops, multiple pastors all in their church and stuff. So in order to be a biblical church, you have to have multiple pastors. And they say this as it like, like a church meeting in a house with where you could fit maybe 20 people in or 30 people in or whatever. They're saying, well, you need to have multiple pastors. Why? Now, look, it makes sense when the church has grown to thousands to have multiple pastors, multiple teachers coming in, and multiple people caring for the people of the church and getting all the job done that needs to get done. That makes perfect sense. But you're not seeing the same thousands and thousands and thousands of people and that massive growth happening that happened in the book of Acts. So if you're going to compare, oh, this is how the church has to be, you have to have multiple, you know, that's ridiculous. The Bible gives us all the qualifications for pastors. I mean, most churches don't even have that many people that are even qualified to fill that role, yet the house church movement wants to tell you, no, 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 you're not scriptural unless you have multiple pastors and you know, a plurality of elders and all this other stuff. It's nonsense. Basically, what we see here in Acts chapter 6 are people that were, um, it doesn't call them this, but essentially they're kind of filling the role of a deacon. And they were, chose, they were chosen out of, as people who were already full of the Holy Ghost. They were doing good works. They were known as people who loved God and loved to serve. They were already ministers in the church, but now they were appointed to a specific position of leadership within the church to make sure that these jobs get done. And when they were appointed, it lists off all the names. Verse number six says, um, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the laying on of the hands is their basically being ordained. It's, it's them receiving, one, it's receiving more of the Holy Ghost. They already had the Holy Ghost. They were saved individuals. But they were receiving an, an anointing, essentially, to, to fulfill a role and to fill a job and to do a job for the church. And they had their hands laid on them, and they were prayed and then, um, and then it says, after that happened in verse 7, and the word of God increased and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. It was the right thing to do. And uh, that way the, the disciples were able to focus all of their time on the word of God. And they had other great men of God also doing the work that needed to be done within the church. Now, turn if you to Acts chapter 8. Just page or two over there from Acts chapter 6. We're just getting started here with some of these examples of the laying on of hands. Remember, that's what we're talking about, the laying on of hands. It's a basic doctrine. Acts chapter 8, verse number 5, where we're going to start reading. We're going to see here the Holy Ghost being given through the laying on of hands. Verse number five reads, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So, just getting the context here, we're getting to, to the point I want to focus on a little bit. Philip comes into Samaria. He comes into the city of Samaria. He's preaching the gospel. Well, in this place, there was a man called Simon, and he was, like, the people looked to Simon as some great guy, but he was into sorcery and witchcraft, and he had bewitched the people into them thinking that he was some special man of God. He had some special powers, 
and, and they kind of look to him for guidance, for instruction, as someone who's maybe close with God. But when they heard the gospel, they got saved. A lot of these people are like, oh, wow, yeah, this is the truth. They recognized the truth being preached unto them, and they, and they received Christ, and they, and they got saved, and they got baptized. So now it says here that Simon himself believed also in verse number 13. And when he was baptized, he continued to fill up and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. So praise God, this guy gets saved also. This guy who formerly was, was into witchcraft and sorcery and bewitched the people, he saw the truth. He heard the gospel. He got saved. He believed. He got baptized, and he's, he's looking at all the great work that Philip's doing because they're performing miracles. There's great signs being done. The great power of God is going forth, and, um, and, and he's looking at all this happening, and he's amazed by it. Look at verse 14. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now I want to make an important distinction here, and I, I didn't have this in my notes, but it's, as I'm reading this, it's important to, to explain this concept. And this concept's worthy of an entire sermon in and of itself. There's a difference between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is what a believer receives when you get saved. When you're born again, the Holy Spirit comes, and the Bible says it you know, dwells inside of you and is in you. There's a difference between that and the power of the Holy Ghost you know, coming on a person and performing, you know, these, in these cases, healings and things like that. They're, they're two different things. The power of the Holy Ghost coming upon people has happened all throughout history. One, of the, one person who's, who's, who it's spoken of, I think more than anyone else in the Bible, is Samson, where the Bible says that the Holy Ghost came upon him. And all these stories where Samson, you know, the Holy Ghost comes upon him and then he has all this strength and he lifts up the gates of the bars of the city and he walks out with them. You know, and all the great um, acts of his might and the things that he did was through the power of the Holy Ghost. It was supernatural. It wasn't his own muscles. He wasn't some big tough guy working out. No, the things that he did was completely through the power of God. The Holy Ghost has always come upon people and, and given them you know, the, these powers to do the things that God has for them to do. It gives people boldness. It gives people you know, uh, so many different qualities that God wants for them to have in order to perform the job that they have to do which is separate from the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, which was not given in the Old Testament, which wasn't given until Jesus breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. So I want to make that clear. I could, go, I could spend the entire morning just covering and going through the scriptures on that topic, but that's not what I want to cover this morning. But what we see happening here is that these people are getting saved and they're receiving the indwelling of the Holy Ghost but they don't have the Holy Ghost coming upon them. That happens with the laying on of the hands. It says, For as yet, in verse 16, he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. So Simon was someone who was kind of used to having certain powers because he was using sorcery and stuff and he bewitched people. And he sees this power though and he's like, wow, I want to have that power. Now, I don't think that he had ill intent in his heart when he's asking for the power for people to receive the Holy Ghost. I believe that he was saved because it says that he believed. The Bible says he believed he was saved, and I think he wanted to do good things, but he just had no concept of, of, of the right way of going about receiving the Holy Ghost. And he's just saying, hey, can I give you some money? Can I have this gift too? You know, I want to do these cool things too. And then they rebuke him and, and explain, look, that's wicked. You can't buy the gift of the Holy Ghost with money. And it says in verse uh, 18, and when Simon, or verse 19, saying, uh, excuse me, I read that right, verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. 
Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Now, this is where people who may be well-intentioned can still get into sin. You could, you could look at him and say, oh, I can understand how he do that. And so I said, his heart might have been wanting to serve God even. But the thought of his heart of trying to attain that by money was wicked. And he had to be rebuked for that and told, look, that's wrong. Repent of this wickedness. You know, you have no part in this matter if you think the gift of God is, is purchased with money. I mean, that is completely the wrong way to go about trying to receive the gift of God. And, uh, and, and he's strongly rebuked for that. And then he says in verse 23, For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then Simon, and then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. So I, he's humbled here. He you know, he's receiving Christ. He said, Look, will you please pray for me? Because, you know, without saying it, basically you could tell that, that he's humbled and he's sorry about it. But what we see in this story is that this whole, the Holy Ghost is given when the, when the disciples came and were laying on the hands of the people that already believed. So the people who are already believers, they come and, um, and they're given these gifts from the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands. Is how these gifts of the Spirit are given to them. Now, um, before we turn, if you would, to Acts 13. I want to I make this clear also. We're not a Pentecostal charismatic church. Okay? I believe in the power of God. Amen and amen. I believe that God is capable of doing just as much today as he ever has been capable of doing at any point in history. God's capable of performing miracles, healing, all, all the various things that you see in the Bible, God's capable of doing all those things today. And I believe those things do happen. But the way in which they happen at the, at the start of the New Testament in the book of Acts, I believe the Holy Ghost was being given out more. These gifts were being given out more at that point, signifying the change in the law or the change from the, from the Old Testament to the New Testament and putting this God's stamp on, hey, when, when you make all of the changes that, that happen between from sacrificing animals to no longer receiving a sacrifice, um, the local church having more authority, and, and the, the, the changes that were made, God had to basically put a stamp of approval on it, basically show that the doctrine that's being taught is definitely from God. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, he was preaching the word of God, but he also did the works and the miracles. And he even said, you know what? Believe me for the works that I do. If the thing, you know, how could a man that's not of God be doing the things that Jesus did? This is one of the proofs that God was using to show people, hey, this is the truth. This is from God. And I believe that one of the reasons that so many people were speaking with other tongues, which a tongue is just a language. They were able to communicate with people in a language they didn't already know, and they were able to talk to them and give them the gospel and get people saved. And they were able, there's the, the, the apostles were, were healing people. And all these great works were being done and being manifest because the word of God needed to be spread throughout the whole world. And it was being signified that this is the truth through these great wonders and miracles. Now, I'm not saying those things aren't possible today, but it's not. There was a specific purpose for how much that was given at this time. And I don't believe that, it's, that the, God is working with people the same way that he did at this point today. I'm not saying he can't. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be um, you know, relying on God and praying to God. But however, God, whatever, whatever you need for, for, to get job, the job done, for, excuse me, <laughs> whatever you need to get the job done for God, God's going to give you what you need for that. Now you look throughout history, again, and throughout the whole Old Testament, Thousands of years, how many times is it recorded that people are doing miracles and healing people? It happened, but it didn't happen in such high frequency that you see in the book of Acts, right? 
I believe it still can happen today, but we're not going to see the same frequency that we saw in the book of Acts because there was a specific reason and purpose for those miracles being performed in the book of Acts. Does that make sense? That's the position that we take here. I could show you again, there, there's, there's a few topics here I'm kind of going over that could require their own sermon all uh, on their own to, to give all the scriptural evidence for this. But I want to make clear, since we're talking about gifts of the Holy Ghost, we're talking about the laying on of hands, where we stand as a church and, and the doctrine that we believe about these things. So you're in Acts chapter 13. We're going to see... Um, also, in the Bible, there's a pattern of men being called of God to do a certain work and other leaders ordaining them, laying hands on, and sending them out. And then we see them doing great works that are filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 13, verse number 1. <clears throat> the Bible says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas, and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So we see here people, prophets and teachers, they're, they're already have been studying and learning and faithful in church and, and, and doing a great work for God. Then the Holy Ghost says, I've got a job for these people to do. The Holy Ghost calls them and says, these people, they're, they've all, they're proven themselves faithful. Now I'm going to send them out and I've got a job for them to do. And this is the way, if you want to be used of God, you need to first prove yourself faithful in the things that he's given you to do. Don't take too much on yourself to go off and, and, and call yourself to go do some great thing. Start doing the work that you know you're supposed to be doing right here. The Holy Ghost calls them, and then look what happens after the Holy Ghost said, Look, I've called these people, verse 3, and when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. They were called the Holy Ghost, but they were sent out by the leadership, by the men in the church to go out and actually do the work. The, the Holy Ghost wasn't the one laying the hands on them, the Holy Ghost called them, they listened. And the people sent them out. The leadership sent them out, laid their hands on them. They sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. This is the order of things within the New Testament church. You have people who want to serve God, do the work. The Holy Ghost ought to be calling that person to do a specific work. And you could usually tell who that is because those are the people doing most of the work already and ministering and being teaching you know, and, and, and doing as much as they can, it's going to become evident that God's got another job for them to do um, through the Holy Ghost. And then the church lays their hands on them, sent them out, and now they're sent off to do the work and they're ordained to do a work. Uh, turn, flip back, if you would, to Acts chapter 9. Even the Apostle Paul was chosen specifically by Jesus Christ. He had a job to do, chosen of Jesus. Acts chapter 9, you see, uh, is the story of the, the Apostle Paul before he was the Apostle Paul, when he was Saul of Tarsus on his way to persecute the church. And he was on the road to Damascus to, to try to persecute the church of God and, and imprison them and, and get them to stop teaching and preaching the Lord Jesus Christ. But, um, of course, he met Jesus in the way. Jesus met him. There was a great light. He was blinded. And Jesus told him, hey, go into the town and look out for, uh, find Ananias. He's going to tell you what you need to do. Jesus was the one that chose him. Jesus picked him to do a specific work. God wanted him to go and do a specific work. But he still had to go to Ananias, a man that God was using. And we're going to see here, look at verse number 17. After Paul had, had uh, gone and seen Ananias, it's, the Bible says in verse 17, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house. And putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales. And he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. Ananias, I believe, gave the Apostle Paul the gospel, and he got saved in this moment when the, when the 
you know, when, when he received his sight. And then, of course, he was baptized after that. But he also put his hands on Paul, and he, Paul, the Apostle Paul was filled with the Holy Ghost. So another example or instance of the laying on of hands, and especially with this man, before he went off and did a great work for God. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Timothy was ordained as an elder. He was ordained as a pastor. And the epistles of Paul to Timothy and to Titus, are, they're, they're known as the pastoral epistles because he's giving advice, he's, he's giving instruction unto these pastors in their job and what they need to do. And he exhorts Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4 not to neglect the gift that he received through the laying on of hands. Verse number 14 of 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Bible reads, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. It's important to see all the scriptural models of the laying on of hands in the book of Acts and the fact that it is a fundamental principle. That's the milk of the word. This is all part of God's plan for his work to be done. This is the example that's being set forth. We can see that there's an order to it. Everything in the church is supposed to be done decently and in order. And the laying on of hands is necessary to provide the power. So what, the reason why I'm kind of going into this is because there's a lot of people today who want to think, well, I want to serve God. Well, I'll just go out and start a church. But that's not going to be a biblical way of, of, of churches being started. When we look at, the, at the, the way things have been done and recorded in Scripture, look, serve the Lord the way that God has told you to serve Him in His Word. That's why we don't just come up with some bizarre, weird, new ways of, of serving God that's not found in His Word because He didn't tell us to do that. He wants us to do specific things. We know that just individually, even just outside of the church, we ought to be communicating with God. We ought to be praying to God. We ought to be having faith in God and relying on Him to help us in all of our areas of life, in every area of need. We ought to be, um, you know, preaching the gospel, preaching the word of God to other people, telling other people about Jesus Christ, how they could be saved. These are things that we ought to do. But within the church, God has ordained and appointed men to lead and has, has created roles of you know, the elder and the deacon and is given a, an authority structure within the church that's beneficial for all believers. And it's something that's necessary um, for, for all believers to learn from and to grow and to be a part of the church and be a part of the family. This is, you know, if it wasn't important, God wouldn't have created leaders. God wouldn't have put these positions and put all the qualifications required for these positions if it wasn't so important. <clears throat> People today want to ignore the biblical model of pastors being ordained and just make themselves a bishop. Uh, turn if you go to Titus chapter 1. There's a few pages to the right from 1 Timothy. You go to Titus chapter 1. Verse number five, the Bible says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, which means lacking, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Titus was charged with this job of ordaining elders, ordaining pastors in Crete. Because what happened was, you know, the Apostle Paul and others, they were going out and they're preaching the gospel to all these various nations. And as people were getting saved, you know, they started congregating together and forming churches because that's what church is, a congregation. And in these early churches, they didn't, all have, they didn't have elders necessarily, but they needed them. It was important for them to have a leader, important to have someone who is going to teach them, someone who's already spiritually mature to be an elder. And 
fit the qualifications that the Apostle Paul laid forth unto Titus and to Timothy as to these are the people that fit the bill to be a pastor, to be an elder. We use the word pastor. I use the word pastor more than the Bible does because it's what you know, people understand the term maybe a little bit more than an elder. You hear the word elder, sometimes you might think of a Mormon or, um, or just someone who's really old. Or if you think of... Um, you know, the Bible talks about bishops as well. It's another term for the same position. But then you might think of the Catholic Church when you hear bishop, right? It, it doesn't matter. I, I want to stay consistent. You know, the, the, the three terms are used scripturally interchangeably. Elder, bishop, pastor. It's the same role. It's the same job. They perform the same function. So Titus is being instructed to ordain elders in every city. Because he needs to set in order that which is lacking. If you just have a group of people meeting somewhere, meeting at a house, meeting a building, you have a church, but there's no leader, there's no elder, there's no pastor to instruct, there's something lacking in that church. That's not the way God designed for church to be. That's why church is not just some Bible study where everyone sits around a coffee table and just talks about the Bible. That's not church. Church isn't tuning into the internet either and just listening to, to whoever preach a sermon. That's not church. Church is a congregation. You're getting together with other believers. The Bible says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But so much more that as, as you see the day approaching, we need to be getting into church. We need to be exhorting one another and uh, exhorting one another unto love and to good works and also to receive the teaching and instruction from the, uh, the, the leader, from the elder. Now, um, this was an important task, and it's up to the person doing the ordaining to determine whether a person is qualified. So Titus was charged to ordain elders. That local congregation was not charged to ordain an elder. Titus, who was already ordained, who was already found worthy, was the one that was then charged to ordain someone out of that other group. It was his responsibility. The epistles were written specifically to Titus and Timothy, not to the church meeting in Crete. There's other epistles to the Romans, to the church of Thessalonica that are written to the churches. These letters were written to men, to individuals, to people who are already ordained of God to ordain others to run and to lead the churches there. They were given the requirements um, and it was their job to do so. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We see the, 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 the list of requirements in more detail. Titus has some, but they're not quite as, as, as detailed as 1 Timothy 3 is. I'll just read for you Titus 1 where we were. Um, it says, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given a filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. And it goes on and on. And it, and it lines up perfectly with the, the epistle that uh, Paul wrote to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. It's good if you want to be a pastor, if you want to be a bishop. That's great. That's a good work to do. And then it lists off what the, the qualifications that need to be met in order for a person to be ordained as a bishop. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. So they need to be married, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without lest he fall into reproach in the snare of the devil. It's easy for people to look at this list and say, oh yeah, I fit the bill in all these things. But see, your, your perception of yourself is going to be skewed a little bit because most people think higher of themselves in general than maybe someone else would. 
And the job of ordaining a bishop is given to other people who have already been ordained to, to look at a man and examine them and say, do they fit this bill? And, and to find out that the job of Timothy and Titus, if they didn't know all the people that well because they were running another church, they would have to go and, and do their due diligence to see, do they have a good report of other people in town? Ask about this guy. Hey, how does this guy do? How is this guy's family? You'll know, watch them, observe them. See, you know, is this person known for being hospitable? Is this person able to teach really well? Can you understand what he's saying? Or does no one have a clue what he's talking about? These are the qualifications that they know. And it says not a novice. And that is an important one. The novice has a tendency to get lifted up with pride, which is what the Bible says right here. A novice is just someone who's a beginner, someone who's just starting out, someone who doesn't have a lot of experience, someone who doesn't necessarily have all the knowledge either that's going to be required. People who might have a lot of zeal, but not according to knowledge. And when you get someone who's just a novice in a position of ruling. That's what the Bible says. If a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? There is a ruling involved over the church and the direction of the church for the, the man who's ordained as the elder or the bishop or the pastor to be running the church. Now it is a church family and you ought to be caring for the people here. Also, it's not like some, you know, we're not, we're not under some, some iron fist here in the church. That's not what it's all about. But there is someone in charge. Just like at my home, there's not, uh, it's not an iron fist in my, in my house. I love my children. I do a lot and sacrifice a lot to help my wife, to help my children. But at the end of the day, I'm in charge. I'm the one directing the way the house is going to be run. And it's the same way in the church. And that's why you look at, at someone who has children who's already running their house. Say, well, if you're, able to run, you know, if you're not able to run your house where you only have a limited number of people in it, you know, maybe four, five, six, seven, whatever, how are you going to run a church? How are you going to keep everything under control? How are you going to look after and help the people that need help in your church? How are you going to do the full job of pastoring if you can't even take care of your family? So this is, you know, all of these things need to be looked at by somebody else. You can't just take this on yourself and be like, well, I rule my house while I do all this other stuff. Therefore, I'm just going to run, start my own church and, and go with it. That is not scriptural. That is not the biblical model. So if you went to Hebrews chapter 5, unfortunately the same people that don't respect the position of the bishop as given by the Bible and the authority that God ordained are also the novices that think they're qualified and would do such a better job and willing to take the honor on themselves. I've, I've heard people literally say things. Younger guys in the faith, maybe been saved for a few years, have been listening a lot, preaching and growing and learning. Then they get to this point oftentimes where they got puffed up and they think, oh, I could do way better than the pa you know, pastor so-and-so. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He doesn't know what he's doing. I could do a way better job than him. And they start getting lifted up in themselves and have no clue what they're talking about. But they think that because they've been saved for a couple years and they've made a lot of changes and they've grown, you know, praise God for the growth, but we got to be very, very careful that our wisdom and the knowledge that we attain doesn't puff us up. The Bible says that, that knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. We need to balance our knowledge, our wisdom, what we learn with using that to help other people. That's what charity is. You're caring for others. You're taking what you've learned and applying that to be a minister unto them. That keeps you humble. But see, when people aren't doing that, aren't concerned about other people, and aren't esteeming others better than themselves, they start thinking, oh, I'm so smart. Oh, I know everything. Oh, I need to tell everybody else what to do. And that is very common among novices. Novices who haven't been out in the field, who haven't been working humbly, who haven't been serving others. Hebrews 5, verse number 1, the Bible reads, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men, 
in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them excuse me, that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity? And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer sin, for, for sins. Excuse me. And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The honor of being put in a position by God is not something you take on yourself. Hebrews 5 very explicitly says this. He's all about, you know, every high priest is taken from among men and ordained. He says, no man takes this honor unto himself and say, I'm going to be a priest of God. The Bible says, even Jesus Christ himself didn't do that. Jesus Christ could have. He had all authority and power to be able to take an honor on himself, would he not? Completely justified, free from sin, doing all, you know, all the good work, everything. He could have been legitimately capable of doing that. And no one could say anything about it because he's Jesus Christ. But even he didn't. The Bible says that Christ glorified not himself to be made in high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. God the Father ordained Jesus Christ and gave him the honor and the glory put upon him. You, you know, honor and respect isn't something that you put on yourself. It has to be given by others. And the honor of serving the Lord in a, in a job or a function like a priest or as, a, as a, a, a preacher, as a pastor, needs to be given. Someone else honors you. The church honors a person by saying, we have found this man to be faithful. We find him to meet these qualifications that God expects and demands from a pastor to have. So we're going to ordain him. We're going to lay our hands on them and help them by to receive the Holy Ghost, to give him that extra power that he needs to go out and do this great work for God and then send him out to do that work. Now, this, and this is my last point, but this was a concept that I didn't fully even understand before I was ordained to, to pastor this church. I had thought about it, and um, even prior to my ordination, I wasn't quite sure how it was going to happen because I had never been in a church where people were sent out. I hadn't seen it done before. And all I did was have the scripture and I was reading this. And, um, you know, I had, I had an understanding which hasn't changed. I, I understood it, but I didn't understand it completely, the importance of the laying on of hands until after it happened to me. And I'll, I'll just explain to you my experience because... This is important because even though you might not see the way that the Holy Ghost worked through the apostles' lives that we read about with them healing people in, in a way that's, that's visible in that regard, the Holy Ghost works in many ways. And for me personally, prior to becoming a pastor, I was a faithful church member. I would, you know, I would do, I tried to just be the best church member I could be. So in that capacity, there were certain things I was called on to do. Sometimes I would preach in front of the church. So, you know, I would do whatever random tasks. But um, I know that, that my preaching skills weren't that great. There's a lot of things that, that needed a lot of improvement. But I could only go so far. I mean, if, if, if I'm relying on myself physically to do a job, especially at work for God or preaching or something like that, I'm not going to get very far at all because my speaking spells overall are not that great. But what is what was given, what I know for a fact, I don't just believe this, I know I was given what I needed to get this job done. There was a lot of thing, areas where I lacked. Um, and I'm not talking about the requirements for, for a pastor. I was already deemed worthy of that. But areas where I lacked to, in, in doing the important job of pastoring a church that was supplied and met by the Holy Ghost. And that didn't 
I didn't receive the gifts of being able to do a lot of the things that were required in the church until after the, 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 the hands were laid on me and I was ordained and sent out to do this work. And um, I'm sorry, it's hard to be specific and articulate what I mean by that. Part of that has to do with the, with the, the teaching and preaching and a lot of it has to do with what I've seen, the Holy Ghost working here in my preparation for sermons. And, and look, this is, this is not glorifying me whatsoever because this is all the work of God. And the lives that have been changed just coming through our church on things where I'm thinking like, why should I even preach on this subject? I have no idea. Well, I'm going to do it anyways because I just kind of had that prompting to do so. And then I find out later it's exactly what so-and-so needed. It's exactly what this person or that person needed to hear and needed to, be, to learn from Scripture. And I don't think that I would have that same, be used in the same way to do that if, if the proper channels weren't followed and the hands weren't laid on me to receive the Holy Ghost, the ghost to be able to, to perform the job that God has given to me to do. And that's an understanding. This, this is just the understanding of the laying on of hands and why it's important. And that it's not... Um, the power of the Holy Ghost is, is consistent as far as what God's capable of doing. But God's going to give the individual who has their hands laid on what they need to accomplish the job that God has for them to do. So you may never see me lay hands on another person and, and heal a disease or a sickness. Maybe you will, maybe you won't. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to deny the power of God at all, ever. I won't do that. But it doesn't mean that the, the, the Holy Ghost isn't there. You know, the, the Pentecostals want to use the, oh, if you're not speaking in tongues, you don't have the Holy Ghost, right? They just say that this is an arbitrary thing. You're not saved or whatever if you don't speak in tongues. Their concept of speaking in tongues is different than the Bible's concept anyways, but that's a whole other sermon. The Holy Ghost manifests itself and gives people gifts in uh, severally as he will, the Bible says. And... Um, it's, a, it's an important concept of, of the laying out of hands and ordaining that we don't want to get away from because there's too many people out there now that are trying to, to steer people off into not being scriptural to, and, and starting up these house church movements and, and diminishing the importance of church in the roles that God has ordained. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for... Um, for your words and for the clear instruction that we have, uh, especially as New Testament believers, dear Lord, and how we ought to operate things and, and how things ought to be run within your church. God, I pray that you please just help us to um, continue to grow in our knowledge and our wisdom, dear Lord, and that um, we would use that knowledge and, and have charity towards others so we won't be lifted up in pride. And I pray that you would please help our church to reach uh, a lot more people to bring them closer to you and to, and to get people saved, dear Lord. I pray that you please bless the soul winning this afternoon. I pray that you please uh, allow us to, to get all of our work done before, before any storms might come through that might uh, threaten to stop our work, dear Lord, and that you would just allow us to, uh, to utilize the time that we have here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.